Okay, hello. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks very much for joining us at this uh, Institute for Emerging Market Studies uh, seminar on China's industrial policy for semiconductors and what lessons that might hold uh, for the rest of the world as well as for the rest uh, for other emerging uh, markets. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce briefly our, our speaker for this afternoon. Uh, she's uh, Dr. Alicia Gatia Herrero. She's the Chief Economist for Asia Pacific at Mathesis and a senior and a senior fellow at the Google uh, Institute. She's also an adjunct professor here at HKUSD and an advisor to the Hong Kong Monetary Authority's research arm, among many other advisory and academic positions uh, she holds. So today's topic is could, could or today's seminar couldn't have come at a better time. We're going to be talking about China's uh, eight-year-long effort to support, promote uh, self-sufficiency in chip production. Uh, this endeavor hasn't been successful despite huge financial support. Uh, this can partly be explained by China's low starting point in the highest value part of the chip supply chain, as well as US sanctions. I mentioned earlier that this seminar couldn't have happened at a better time because uh, just I think a few days ago, the US uh, announced new technology sanctions. And I think China increasingly faces a formidable task uh, to, in order to maintain its progress in fabrication and chip design while reconfiguring capacity to reduce reliance on external equipment and components. Uh, I think Professor Harry uh, uh, will also touch on what implications this would have for other emerging markets, particularly those that don't want to choose right, between China uh, and, and the US. So with that as uh, the backdrop uh, and, and the introduction, uh, let me hand over the time to Alicia. Uh, and she'll speak for about half an hour to 40 minutes and we have plenty of time for questions. Over to you, Alicia. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, great. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank, uh, uh, thank Hong Kong UST, but especially the in Institute for Emerging Market Studies uh, for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here uh, because this is a topic I think needs to be that needs to be handled or looked at uh, from many perspectives and i think uh, ims is a great place to do this because it's a multidisciplinary effort uh, and and uh, we all you know can look at things from different perspectives it's, it's it's of course an engineering question which i'm not going to deal with it's a geopolitical question that I'll try to look into, but it's also an economic question. Um, and I think that's that's the way we can uh, move forward in, in better understanding what might be one of the key, um, uh, I would say minefields, mm -hmm. battlefields. Uh, there, there's many ways to the, describe this semiconductor bottleneck, if I may say, which is not only a bottleneck for China. It's actually a bottleneck for everybody because it is ba basically it's one of these industries that is based on this very simple idea, but is which is becoming much less simple, which is globalization. So in a way, nobody uh, can produce, literally nobody, semiconductors on its own. And this is not only about China, it's about the US, it's about Europe, it's about Taiwan itself. Uh, Taiwan can't produce semiconductors without lithography from the Netherlands, without design from the US. So in a way, what we are experiencing is a, this is something I think I really want to say is it's like a case study of what happens when when trade deglobalizes. And and in a way, China's reaction as, as many times happens with China, very forward looking to this reality comes early in time since 2015. And, and that early reaction by China is in a way followed for perhaps not exactly the same reasons, but still followed by the US and Europe with, this, with their own industrial policy programs. So why everybody follows? Because this is not only China's problem and because this is linked to this deglobalization wins that we're all going through. So that's basically the starting point uh, for, for this presentation. So. I cover actually two things. One is um, a leadership, uh, uh, thought leadership piece that uh, 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 IEMS is going to publish, uh, kindly publish very soon. 
uh, I understand it's basically ready, so it can you you can receive it uh, soon after the co this event, and that deals with the first question: China's experience um, with semiconductor semiconductor industrial policy. This is not just to evaluate China for its own sake. I mean, it's also a way to offer lessons for others um, with uh, more recent industrial policies, whether it's the US, the EU, or more recently, even India for that matter. So so what, what works, what might not work as well. So that's, that's the first uh, part. And the second part, as Donald rightly uh, pointed out, is something that I decided to include, even if it's not in the thought leadership piece, because it's very important, which is the US recent containment measures, uh, new export controls, and, and, and what it means for um, not only China, but actually the whole value chain and cer certainly Asia as a whole, because it's so embedded in, in this particular uh, supply chain, chip supply chain. So if, I, if you allow me, I'll start with the first part, which is China's experience with the semiconductor uh, uh, sector and how it all started in a way. And of course, you, some of you listening to me today may know much more than me about this uh, particular um, uh, case, whether it's because you've, you've been in the policymaking part of it, whether you've suffered from it in, in the sector or, or you benefited from it, yeah, depending on, on which side you were. Uh, but my, I mean, in, in my humble capacity, what I'm trying to do is not so much the details of how you know the disbursements were made, whether I mean there's a lot of analysis on whether equity involvement works better or you know or or it should be more transparent subsidy based and so on. That that I'm not actually going into the details of what kind of industrial policy this time would have been better, but more generally, what was the theme of this policy and would have been uh, whether it would have been achievable overall independently possibly on the on the uh, instruments uh, chosen for for that industrial policy so so it's kind of a you know a, a top down type of analysis of of, of this issue um, so i guess the the starting point which um, we all know well uh, is uh, made in china 2025 and uh, the the key uh, i mean the very important uh, role um uh, uh, of of the semiconductor industry within that in that you know multi sectoral uh, uh, project or or strategic plan from China, I think the realization in a way that this was really an attempt not only to move up the ladder because here there's two things yeah I mean you can do industrial policy to move up the ladder simply because you also want to export. Uh, or say engage in the value chain uh, at a higher level. And the other thing is that you may actually want to be self-sufficient for reasons beyond moving up the ladder. Yeah, these, these are two different things. And I think the dual circulation uh, strategy in 2020 in a way um, clarifies that China's intention was not only, um, let alone the fact that it isn't easy, but was not only to move up the ladder. There was also this idea of becoming uh, uh, more self-centered. I wouldn't say it's self-reliance in the sense that you don't, you're not going to export. We all know that dual circulation has that second circulation, which is I continue to export. But I know that if push comes to shelf, I can uh, I can continue to run my industry, even update, upgrade my industry without the need for anybody else and by anybody else we probably mean the US given its major role in design which is kind of the upstream part of the supply chain uh, as chip supply chain so so that's why uh, for me um, I like to link these two things made in China plus dual circulation because it clarifies that the objective was in a way double it was upgrading plus self-reliance plus being able, as I said, if need be, not necessarily uh, uh, and definitely um, inward looking, but if need be, 
uh, being self-reliant. I think these are the two things. What's the difference between 2015 and 2022? Guess, the US. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe the objective in 2020, 2015 was only upgrading the industry. Maybe, I mean, I'm nobody to judge, but certainly by 2022, a number of actions had been taken already by the US. Uh, the last one I'm going to go through later, um, just to me, a, a game changer. It's just uh, you know a follow up of of uh, all the big one of previous actions, whether it's the entity list, etc. So, of course, a stepping up export controls even before. So you know the, uh, the whole point I want to make here is that that change, that double objective, self reliance, comes after um, US containment on tech containment and in particular on, on this on this key sector for China, given China's bottlenecks in in, in the uh, semiconductor supply chain. So uh, so basically that's that's the first thing to 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 clarify. I mean why we and uh, start why we ended up here uh, in, in this with this massive uh, industrial uh, program and then um, the other thing to note is that China is simply humongous, a humongous part of the market. So, so China is forty percent of global sales. So, for any semiconductor company, China is its key client. Uh, or for some, like the SMC, maybe the second key client because in that case the US is even bigger. But, but the point is, there you go. Either the first, or or in some rare cases the second. And uh, I think this is uh, in itself a big issue because China has many, many people already know, which I'm very happy about because it's crucial, imports more semiconductors than oil. And that's, that's, that's why we tend to think about semiconductor as the new oil, not only because it's crucial for every sector, but also because it's a massive uh, um, expenditure or revenue, depending on whether you are, say, TSMC as opposed to you know, uh, electric vehicle company in China, you name it. So depending on where you are in this, in this, um, in this phase. So I also want to mention that uh, not only is China's demand very large, is that it keeps on increasing, and the prospects are such that uh, that increase in demand will continue. And you may say, well, that doesn't fit the fact that China is decelerating. Well, but China is still increasing its market share in many key products, most of which are very chip in intensive, whether it's uh, uh, solar panels or you know uh, wind turbines or, or electric vehicles, you name it. So in a way, for what China is specializing in, if I may say so, uh, uh, semiconductors are even more important than, than on average for, for countries with different, um, I don't know, like export structures. So, so, for me, the, the China's need to, to conduct, and, and let alone its own economic model, but China's need to conduct industrial policy to me is a no-brainer. I mean, they, of course they had to. Um, and the question is how you do this. What was this, again, the, the, I mean, the design of, of the, that industrial policy, how to judge that? And, and again, the judgment comes very much uh, based on China's own economic model. So, you know, we, we may argue that there was a lot, a lot as we, we argue in the paper, that um, uh, the bulk of the two big funds, which I will show uh, details in, in, in a moment, uh, actually were geared, to, except for SMIC, and, you know, even the origin of SMIC, you know, one could argue that that is one of those private but not fully private companies. But beyond that, um, a lot of the funds went to state-owned companies. Uh, and by the way, a lot of the funds came from state-owned companies, which is not uh, to be sur not surprising because this is state-led state -led in industrial policy. This is not a special of China. This is true in the US or Europe. It's more about where it was directed that, that makes a difference, yeah? Um, so, um, so, yeah, um, perhaps... Um, mm, Perhaps I when I before I move to that that I just wanted to show here a little bit 
what China is doing in, in the semiconductor industry. And of course, when we move to 2021, you already have the consequences of that industrial policy, meaning we're already in, in the midst of what impact of that policy in, in, the, in the market, in the semiconductor market in China. And there you see that a lot of what's happening in value is design, but actually that design doesn't come, necess that is not produced in China. And what is really mostly um, um, produced in China is, is uh, OSAT. And, and that's where you see a slight increase, but the, 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 the bulk of the value added is not yet there. Uh, uh, so now, you, if you look at the supply, going back to the supply, uh, so China basically is trying to increase its supply increase its supply uh, where um, in, in the three main areas, I'll show you an a, a infographic in a second. Um, but if you sum all of that according to value added, I given the right value added to say design, which is obviously the, the highest, the US dominates. Maybe it's not when you look at gross data, export data, because of course, if you ex export from China, it seems China is producing it all. But if you look at input output data, that's not the case. So the reality of things is that the value added is in the US. And that's where the story starts. I think it's not so much about China exporting semiconductors, which China already does, is that it controls the flow, the origin, of, of, of that uh, IP or, you know, so that it can actually produce them and most not only export them, but actually use them for, for its key uh, sectors. I would add beyond the three I mentioned, electric vehicles, um, solar panels and, and uh, wind turbines, a very important one, the military, yeah. If you think about supersonic weapons, you can't think of those without, I guess, uh, at least seven, and below nanometer uh, semiconductors. So, you know, it's just simply too important to be ignored. And there you go in this uh, next uh, graph, what I tried to do is a little bit uh, maybe confusing, but what you have there, like say that violet color foundry, that's uh, Taiwan. So basically Taiwan dominates as we all know the foundry part, but it doesn't domi dominate at all the, you know, the, the design part. Uh, and, and in a way, this is why I'm saying that, that nobody uh, is really independent in this value chain. There's another graph that I would like to, yeah, this is a little bit the same idea. Uh, Taiwan dominates the foundries and, and you see that, that uh, China has a rather high share here, but many are actually subsidiaries of DSMC or other companies, basically foreign companies. Uh, and the question is linking to the second topic that I'm going to cover. These are going to suffer from export bans as well, even those operating in the mainland that are that are foreign companies. So so it's going to get very high, very hard. Uh, this other graph I think is quite interesting. You see not only the dominance of uh, Taiwan in the foundries, which we know is what kind of foundries. So when I, I, I when I show you here that twenty eight percent or so of foundries uh, fabrication basically uh, is in the mainland, this is not the small uh, the smallest nodules, uh, you know, uh, seven and below, which as you see, is basically dominated by Taiwan. The mainland starts. Uh, basically 21 nodules, a little bit 19, 21. So, so that 28% is all about uh, not so advanced semiconductors. Yes, foundries, but not, of, not the most advanced semiconductors. Those aren't produced in the mainland. As you see, it's zero. Uh, well, we know of a case of a seven nanometer it was everywhere in the media, but of course it, it still needs to be commercialized and, and, and fully, I mean, produced in mass production. So that's why you see a zero from uh, five to seven and below uh, five all the way to three uh, nanometers. So that's the reality of things. That's why the value added doesn't match. Even if you look at share of fundraise, et cetera, it doesn't show where the bottleneck is. The bottleneck is in this graph, nothing below 19. That's it. And there's so many things you can't produce 
uh, with semiconductors uh, uh, that are as big as 19, think about supersonic weapons. I mean, not that I'm an expert, I'm sure that you need much smaller uh, chips to do that. And, and not, not only the size, but the sophistication of the, of the nodes. And I think that's, that's basically uh, what's happening. Um, this is not something that I've produced, but I read this article as, uh, as recently as this morning. And I found it so interesting because it gives you a sense of how complex the whole thing is. Yeah, I mean, uh, we think that TSMC can just, you know, again, uh, uh, produce these uh, seven and below nanometers to the point of 85% of the global market, but it can't do so without ASML. ASML, which is um, basically a lithography, a, 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 a Dutch company producing lithography equipment for very advanced semiconductors. I, I mean, they produce also they sell to the mainland for other types, uh, uh, basically um, less advanced semiconductors. But they are their expertise is basically to serve TSMC for the smaller semiconductors. So, so there you go. Um, when the US imposes ex export bans, um, it, it touches upon ASM, ASML's uh, potential yeah, exports to the mainland for smaller semiconductors. Maybe not yet, but that's something they won't be able to do. So it gets extremely complicated. Uh, look at materials there. If you look at in the fabrication phase, um, so basically just to summarize, you have design, fabrication, and then you have the assembly, the packaging, all of that is dominated by Chinese uh, players, uh, but that's less value added. And then fabrication, you have uh, basically Samsung, TSMC, Global Foundries, uh, US company, and then SMIC, but again, 19 nanometer and above, that's the difference. And then on the design is, is mostly US dominated, a few, um, a few European uh, players, uh, especially on the intellectual property side, uh, ARM, and then uh, a couple of German uh, players uh, there too. I, and I think Infineon should be mentioned, although it's not mentioned in the graph. So long story short, what this shows is that if you control the upstream, the design, which is what the US does control, it is easy to think of um, sanctions, let's call them sanctions or export controls that that if introduced properly go all the way to the end user, because you can stop the middle, um, the middleman, if I may say, you know, you can stop ASML because ASML needs the design for the production of its own lithography machines from the US. So it's as simple as ASML will not receive the design, thus ASML will not be able to produce lithography machines for TSMC or the mainland. Maybe they will produce them from TSMC, but then TSMC will not be allowed to use the, a the ASML lithography machines, and which depend on the US design, unless we know where the end user of those uh, uh, small chips from TSMC are. Who are those end users? Is it the military? Is it X, Y? Now, by now, basically nobody, because the 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 list I'm getting to the second point, but it's also interrelated. The 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 list now is so massive, or 31 companies included in the last band that you know it's like no more about military or non-military. It's like you it just can't do anything. And the reality is that this is also because it's now you know fusion te technology. So it's so difficult to disentangle uh, how you're going to use a chip, uh, whether it's military use or civil use. So. Going back to the topic of the, the big splash of money, yeah, the two funds. So there you have big fund one, 2014, big fund two, 2019. So the money was there even before uh, Made in China 2025 was made public, but we all know that that plan uh, had been conceived uh, uh, well ahead and basically was um, according to what I've been told, um, you know, um, sealed uh, by Xi Jinping uh, very soon after he came to power and there you see that this is this is the sources not not the how it's been spent but you can see that there was a little bit of quote-unquote private it's not really private because 
you have China Mobile, but the state-owned company, E-Town Capital, when you look at the, the shareholders of E-Town Capital, I mean, still not very private, China National Tobacco, I don't know why the national China National Tobacco had to support the semiconductor industry, but never mind. These are like cash rich state owned companies. Yeah, China Mobile, China National Tobacco. And then to, to basically reduce the, the bill, you see what I mean? Like the big bill, yeah, for MOFCON or, or for the development banks. Uh, but that that's what it is. It's, it's a kind of like a, a China team type of thing. Um, and in the case of the second fund, actually less uh, public, purely public uh, uh, funds from the Ministry of Finance or, or even from China Development Bank and more unknown funds. Basically, we can't trace, uh, um, I would say, E-Town Capital number two, number three, number four, number five, if you see what I mean. Like a lot of these private equity funds uh, with with uh, not very, I mean, at least at least for me, very hard to 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 disentangle. Um, so, the, what was the strategy for these funds? I think, frankly, it, I would argue it was quite sophisticated, and I don't think either the U.S. Chip Act or the European Chip Act is is any better. To be frank, I, I think it was sophisticated in the sense that it did try to create a, an ecosystem, vertical integration. Uh, acquisition of know-how abroad. So there was a number of uh, design companies acquired one by Huawei, for example. I mean, it, it it was, I mean, this strategy was, in my opinion, um, uh, clear. Uh, perhaps, you know, one would wonder whether you really needed to splash the market with so much money. That's a different thing. Um, it was not only government grants, there were tax breaks, there was our uh, um, uh, subsidies for indigenous innovation. So on the R and D side, low, uh, low interest, interest rate loans, um, etc., and a lot of regulatory support, by the way. But I think what what is harder to understand is the choice of the companies receiving the funds. I think that's where you know you 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 start thinking. Well, um, how were they chosen, and uh, uh, was it? A market-driven force, or wasn't it? And and I think that's where perhaps more could be written. I, I I might not have the skills to do that, but you know, if you ask me, what kind of research I would continue to do on this topic is the choice of the target uh, companies. Yeah, I mean, we have experiences in in Europe also. We just had Intel basically uh, getting quite a lot of uh, quite a few billions in subsidies in in Madeburg in Germany. Why Intel? I mean, was there a tender? Was there, I mean, are, these are basically very much private negotiations or, or I mean, uh, not very transparent negotiations. And the question is, are you putting the money in the best place you can with such a system? So now, how do we assess the success? Um, I mean, frankly speaking, not that you can measure I mean, there's no counterfactual. Yeah, I mean, what we know is that the uh, the assembly part did go up a lot. You remember that number I showed you of uh, China's uh, role in the fundries. Uh, so this is all about, you know, low end fund fundries and then uh, assembly and packaging. It's, it kind of has improved a lot. It is also true that that was the easiest part. Would it ha would it have happened without 150 billion US dollar? Maybe because you have the market, yeah, you have 40% of global sales. So, you know, people might have an interest in setting up a shop where the demand is. So I guess um, it's, it's hard to tell. I guess in some sectors like memory cards, it's been quite successful. So SMIC is the fifth largest company in the world. But at the same time, and this is the irony of things with China, given its size, it's created oversupply and um, prices collapsed after that. And, and you know, the money you were supposed to make might not have been there because you yourself were too big for the market. So, so you know, it's, it's mixed in that sense that maybe, maybe because of China's size, once you move in a direction, you in a way cre create different dynamics for the market. And the other one is, the fact that key players, I mean, this it would be very simple to say corruption and leave it there, but I think it's more complex than that, is that, again, 
it was hard to figure who were the players and where you were put where you were putting the money. So the K of Tsinghua uh, Unigroup, uh, a major uh, default uh, in 2021, uh, is a case in point because, and, and this I'm telling you from you know my kind of banking life or listening to bankers talking about this that nobody really knew is it SOE but then it's not a central SASAC but yes but no but you know like nobody really knew what this was um, even the name was confusing because you know it started like a, like a spin-off but it wasn't and I, I basically think that, um, yes, you may afford this because you're funding it yourself. Yeah, you have 150 billion and it's up to you. But in terms of if it doesn't work, the 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 image issue, yeah, that, that you create out of this is that this was basically uh, a distribution among among players who knew each other. It, that, that it wasn't really a well, I mean, a market driven, um, industrial policy. So, so I think this is perhaps the most important issue. Uh, how to design this in a way that looks uh, more market driven. On, on the end side of it, we all know it's public money, that's fine. Uh, the national tobacco one's fine, but that's, that's not the big issue. The big issue is how you choose the companies uh, which receive these funds. Um, so yeah, um, Again, uh, assembly big success, 19% of global market share, um, but again, dominated by one player. Maybe that's not, you know, you want to generate that competition, yeah? Uh, GCET, uh, and it's by now the third largest global player. So yes, you may say a little bit like SMIC. I mean, you may be creating global champions, national champions on, in the global arena, but I'm not sure that's the first objective. Maybe the first objective is to make sure that this competition domestically so that the, the best actually survive, given that in any event, you're giving all of these funds. So you're already distorting the market pretty intensely. So make sure that the, the funds are distributed, if not evenly to the best players. So I think that's the, 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 the key for me that brings me back to how to design this in the future. And because there's going to be, if I read the results of the party congress uh, properly, there's going to be a future. I mean, there's going to be more money there because this is all about deep tech. China needs to move up the ladder, uh, tech hegemony, you name it. So now that we know that this is going to happen, how do you design it? And 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 and, and the lessons, or at least my my takeaways from this, is that the key is the recipient. How to better uh, choose the recipients, how to make it more mm, uh, market driven, if I may say so. Um, it, so yes, there were some improvements in design, uh, more uh, drive by private sector. So this was slightly more less state driven and market share increased, but this is where the US comes to the forefront. So if, if you think about uh, 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 high silicon and Huawei, I mean, this acquisition, the point is things don't work if somebody does not want you to go further, especially they are dominating the upstream, meaning the design. And I think this is mm, the other issue that part of the, um, I wouldn't say a failure because it's not a failure, but the, the relatively small success, put it this way, is also because of intervention from the US. So some success, but major losses, you know, companies defaulting, lots of money spent, um, yeah, mix, mix, basically to me, mixed results. What, what does this mean for the EU or for the US Chips Act? So we wrote a piece, actually wrote a piece for Bruegel on what it means for the EU uh, and with very specific, uh, you know, uh, recommendations because for the EU is quite important because the, the the act is not yet out as opposed to the US. So there's still leeway. And what we are arguing there is that there should be more money for, for research and development. So basically the key is not to produce so much. In, in, uh, and I think there was a little bit of obsession also in, in the Chinese case with SMIC to, to fab, to fab, to fab. 
maybe for China size, it's fine because you need those chips. But uh, Europe in many uh, ways doesn't really import as many chips as China by all means and purposes. And the need for certain chips isn't there, at least not yet. First, because we're not even very relevant in the ICT uh, supply chain. So the question is, what do we need? Well, what we certainly need, same as China, is not to be too reliant on the US because the day, if the day US, uh, the US says, well, design is only for me, imagine. I mean, that would be, that would be crazy. But if that happens, well, that's like, uh, you know, uh, 73 oil shock yeah, because you can't do anything. So I, I guess the, the point is, do you have the IP? Do you have the design capability? Do you, do you have the R&D? And not to be fully self-reliant, that's not the point, but basically to make sure that your role in the value chain is balanced enough, is relevant enough. You are a player. Uh, so the what we suggest there is indeed to invest more on R&D rather than spend billions um, subsidizing a big fab, whether it's the SMC, uh, Intel as uh, German already did, et cetera. So that's that's the idea. Um, so so for the US, of course, I mean, I, I, by now the, the act is there and there's a lot of money, the SMC is already producing. MediaTek is, is 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 in negotiations and many others. I I guess that's more of I want to become an industrial power again kind of idea. Europe is or I mean Europe has manufacturing. It's, I think it it might not be the same reading, a uh, political reading as for the US. So so that's um, the thing. And the other thing to take into account is that unless you can move to the seven nanometer and below you're going to end up with overcapacity because China is going to be able to produce for sure seven nanometer and above. And what ha happened with uh, uh, with memory cards uh, may happen across the board. So so you better, and, and you're not India, meaning you're not competitive enough to, to in that market. So, so to me for the US and Europe is you better stay, you know, at the highest end of the chain and especially uh, for the U.S., keep your design capabilities for the EU, for the EU, acquire them since you don't have them uh, to, to that extent. So uh, I'll be very brief on the U.S. containment because uh, in a way I've already said quite a lot. This is coming from a recent note at Notixis and it's very detailed. I'm not going to force you to read all of the details. What I've done is to summarize a little bit what you see here in this uh, kind of infographic. So what the infographic uh, does uh, is to, and this is John work uh, with uh, Gary Eng, by the way, I, I, I don't want to forget that. Um, uh, also Anna Texas. Um, what this, this uh, export bans uh, do is first extend the, the number of companies affected in China. It's over here, 31 Chinese, sorry, I don't know what happened. Uh, 31 Chinese firms added to the, unverified list, there's two types of lists. I won't get into the detail of what it means, but you know, it, it's it's much bigger. And then 28 supercomputer entities added. So it's it's a much wider spectrum than, than before. Uh, the other thing that is important is that uh, there is a shorter time frame to comply with BIS, uh, BIS requests uh, to identify end users. So what this means is, imagine, yeah, I am ASML, to go back to the example I, I mentioned before, and I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, so you basically need to identify the end users of your lithography machines. And, and that's very hard. So you, you yourself need to do the job of, you know, who, who is using, who is using the final uh, product that I'm helping produce? And, and, and that's the key. We call this the SWIFT of, uh, of uh, kind of a SWIFT system for semiconductors that the US is trying to develop in the sense that the US is trying to link, to find all of the linkages of the value chain to make sure that it can uh, circuit cut uh, the, when needed, those uh, linkages through this export ban. So, so if you don't tell me who you're selling to, even if you are Dutch and I like you, mm -mm, I like you very much, as we say, I don't care because I know who you're selling to. Uh, you're telling me who you're selling to. 
and the fines in case you know this is not unveiled are humongous by the way if you don't answer you have 60 days i believe if i recall correctly somewhere here in the should be here um or at least we aimed at putting it there i think it's 60 days now uh, i don't know it's 30 30 or 60 overall but the point is a short period of time if you're if you can't answer there you go you suffer export bans and that that's very very compelling foreign firms using U.S. tech uh, also need to comply, and this is already in the news. So um, if, 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 if it's not only about Chinese companies. Uh, and, and if you're a U.S. person, basically you just need a green card, not even a passport, uh, you're banned from supporting Chinese chip makers. So it's just mind boggling. And the sectors covered, so that, that final use goes from artificial intelligence to memory chips to supercomputers and software, advanced equipment, you name it. It's so large. So um, the example, to know whether this will be effective, I mean, not that I, I agree with that being effective. I'm not going to get into whether the US should or should not do this because it's beyond the point now. What I want to say is that in the case of uh, high silicon uh, and Huawei, it was effective before when Huawei was put in the entity list. So basically revenues collapsed. And this is that subsidiary that uh, Huawei uh, basically purchased and in, 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 you know, incorporated uh, on this on chip design. Uh, so, so I would say that uh, it's clearly uh, relevant. The second thing I'm showing you is the approval rate for export licenses globally for the US and the mainland. So you can see that this is about the mainland. This is not about you know uh, general protectionism, you name it, because the, these export licenses have remained nearly stable. Uh, I'm going to jump uh, to the conclusions because uh, 40 minutes have uh, gone by. And so chips, the new oil, as we mentioned, or as I mentioned before, uh, is not only that uh, you want to consume, you want to produce it, because uh, as opposed to oil, it basically depends on your ability to produce. It's, it's not a raw material. And that makes a big difference for industrial policy, as you can imagine. Um, if you are the, the largest end consumer, or, or, or even you know for for re reprocessing or uh, re-export, but basically the largest importer like China, there's no way you're going to say, who cares? I mean, the, the, so in other words, I don't think we even need to to discuss whether China needed industrial policy. To me, and and it's beyond China's model actually. I think it's something that that is understandable. The question is how to design it how expensive it needs to be, 150 billion so far, uh, how you do it, Indige indigenous innovation versus acquisitions, how hard it is to acquire now nowadays because many of these deals are going to be stopped. Um, what's the final purpose, moving up the ladder or self-reliance or both? Um, and then how much more we will see according to the party Congress concept of modernization? And also what should they, U.S. and the EU do with their own uh, industrial policies uh, today. And to me, you know, it seems clear that they need to keep at the you know highest end of the of the supply chain on the design and R and D. But many people disagree with that. Uh, the idea being that if you don't actually produce, you can still be subject to supply chain bottlenecks. You name it. So this is all from my side. Very happy to exchange now. Right. Thank you very much, Alicia. That was really very fascinating as well as being very uh, comprehensive. Uh, you, you made this point about how industrial policy, at least in China, maybe less so in Europe or the US, should uh, industrial policy should be a lot more market oriented. Uh, could you give us some specifics? Because as you say, the, the Chinese system seems to deploy all manner of tools. There's direct grants, there's tax, uh, tax incentives, there's subsidies for R&D. Uh, so I think your issue is not with the kind of tools that are used, but the manner in which companies are chosen. So how, how, would, how would a more effective or more efficient industrial policy look like in terms of uh, which companies are chosen and which companies are targeted? 
Well, I can give the example of electric vehicles in China. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, China has actually deployed subsidies for foreign companies as well. Uh, Tesla has benefited, uh, Volkswagen, others. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a basically a tender. You need to comply with certain rules, localization right. of data. I mean, right. but it sounds more transparent to be frank yeah. compared to to the semiconductor industry. So, yeah. You know, I, I, I can't give you many more uh, examples, but I think that's one where you can you can see the difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, and perhaps because semiconductors are more like strategic, if I may say, compared yeah. to electric vehicles, where, which is basically a commercial commercialization of it's B2C, of it's B2C, yes. whereas this totally. is B2B or B2G. Yes, yeah. totally, totally. Yeah. So, you know, that might make a difference. Yeah. Uh, but I think there's lessons to be learned from from. EVs. Using um, and and the other thing is that um, you know the conditions to receive the subsidies. So you you saw um, companies producing white goods becoming semiconductor producers all of a sudden, and and because the 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 conditions weren't clear. So so I I would think that first you need to make these subsidies more transparent. So a, a, a fiscal subsidy, you and. And then uh, when entering equity, because this is the other thing, many of these funds uh, enter as equity holders of these semiconductor companies. And this is partially the problem we had yeah. with the uh, yeah. uh, Who are you to be uh, an equity holder if you are <laughs> a tobacco national? You know what I mean? Like, I mean, yeah. so so maybe if you needed equity holders, you, you might have had to choose people who knew about the industry to do so, yeah. you know? So... Yeah, I do think there is room for improvement, frankly speaking, in, mm -hmm. in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, I think this relates a lot to some of the early work done on developmental states, where they say what was crucial about industrial policy was something called embedded autonomy. The ones making the decisions need to be embedded enough to know what's going on. They need to be mass, you know, subject matter experts. And at yeah. the same time, be autonomous enough from political pressures, from government you know, dic dictates and directives to make uh, autonomous uh, decisions that are good in this case for the industry in the long run, rather than by driven by political calculations. I think so. I think it, it really speaks to you know what what are the decision mechanisms and 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 what decision makers consider to be right to be the the way in which decisions are made. Uh, there the, the, the are a couple of comments. One was that uh, in your slide you had you said that semiconductor imports in China was thirty three billion US dollars. Uh, so one of our participants or one of our faculty associates said there are also sources which suggest that it was more in the order of $200 billion, which is which makes it even a larger uh, import expenditure item than, 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 than what your slide suggests. Would, would, you, would you have a source on that uh, about the $233 billion figure? Uh, sorry, uh, could you repeat the? Yeah, so so the, the question said there was more a comment about how China yeah. semiconductor import was $33 billion. Other sources suggest that semiconductor imports for China was more in the order of around 200 billion US dollars. Yeah, it, my number is 150 billion, actually. Okay. I don't okay. know, the, maybe my slides are right. confusing. Uh, uh, Europe 43, US close to 60, China 150. 150 is not the sum of the two funds because that would be smaller, but we got that figure summing up some of the local government programs uh, mm -hmm. for semiconductors. It might be bigger. <laughs> That's all I could come up with, right. 150, yeah. Right. Uh, another question. Uh, the, the technology gap is between 3 nm versus uh, 19 nanometers. Well, the US is injecting billions after, the, after approving the CHIPS Act to build the most uh, advanced manufacturing on R&D as well as on STEM education. Uh, so what do you think the scenario is likely to be in three to five years' time? Uh, and when the consumption price for tech products is accelerating, very fast, fast, and this adding to the huge subsidy will make inflation a much bigger problem by then. Yeah, well, I can, uh, I'm not sure I can say, but like maybe I can say the company, but not, of course, not not anything else, mm. but uh, with a, you know, chit chat conversation with uh, somebody from uh, SMIC. Yeah. Um, what I feel might happen, I understand the question. So is the gap going to grow or is it gap going to uh, shrink? Mm -hmm. Um, there is uh, factors uh, beyond, uh, I mean, 
there there are kind of uh, policy factors yeah i mean beyond the money you put for china how much money you put in how much you can buy because this is about leapfrogging yeah you need to buy uh, technology we have this big case arm uh, still open with the subsidiary in china how much ip the subsidiary has uh, can they really disentangle i mean there's many questions maybe a company makes a difference you know it's like let, we this is how uh, innovation goes about and 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 it could be a crucial bottleneck that china manages to 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 bypass and uh, frankly speaking i hope that uh, nabuhar later can add because he's much more of an expert than me but the the the, the point i want to make is that um a lot of what is happening is not market driven only yeah you have first this idea of china being able to leapfrog by from whom is i don't know uh south korea which side is south korea will south korea, you know like many of these questions become geopolitical and therefore how can i know it's a chessboard you know it's like nobody knows um then there's other factors that are more like structural if i may say so is the us really uh moving up on stem i don't know because i'm not an expert but you know people will have very different views about who is moving faster, mm -hmm. whether China or or the US, and mm -hmm. also, of course, of course, also um, this long debated idea as to whether you can be innovative and enough, you know, in an environment that is not very open. I mean, so many questions. It's impossible to answer, to be frank. But what I would say is that, in the same way, maybe maybe what I'm going to say sounds stream, but just to for the sake of argument and make our conversation more um at least uh i wouldn't say memorable but that you probably will remember this one put it this way you know it seems to me a little bit like the space the space um race uh, uh, in the all uh, soviet union us si uh, types with so semiconductors in the sense that i feel a lot of resources are going to put on this both sides um and it's just not only about resources, it's about sometimes even pure luck, pure, you know, like you, you get the right uh, direction at the right time. You get the right Alice at the right time. Um, I frankly think China has to do quite a lot on that one mm -hmm. in, uh, at this point in time. So on the alliances uh, part of, uh, of, of issues, I think, and you may know because I'm European because I'm going to mention the the word that no European can ever uh, avoid, which is the war in Ukraine. And you may say, wow, yes, it is important, very important, because because of the war in Ukraine, basically China has lost a lot of ground with many uh, countries that were like in between, you know? And, and I think I would not only point to Europe, but frankly speaking, I think Japan has had a wake up call. And I would say even South Korea has had a wake up call. So, so because of all of this, I think it's not only about trends. It's more like sudden changes in direction, depending on how you react to major geopolitical factors, your alliances, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. Yeah, I think the point about geopolitical constraints is key. And, and this particular industry is far more vulnerable to those geopolitical considerations. I mean, look at all the other areas where China was able to leapfrog. You mentioned electric vehicles. Uh, I would add high-speed rail. Uh, many elements of AI, like facial recognition, solar panels. I mean, those those were far less geopolitically sensitive. I mean, the scope for dual use, strategic uh, military as well as civilian, uh, was you know in a, in a sense uh, more limited. Whereas this is right as you pointed out, is a, is a critical input to yeah. both military and strategic uh, capabilities. Um, I, I wanted to end the, the the session with a question around how the Chinese could have created more policy space or, or a strategic maneuver strategic maneuver maneuver uh, uh, space for themselves uh, when they announced 2015 uh, made in china 2025 in 2015 there was a bit of a reaction from european countries from the us to some extent but at that time it was not about technological self sufficiency it was mostly a, the term that was used was indigenous innovation and the chinese kind of responded to that backlash by sort of downplaying uh, or, or certainly not mentioning as much uh, made in China 2025. But it seems to me that that 
that sort of uh, more careful, considered uh, rhetoric has gone out of the window. Now it's full on self-sufficiency. Yeah. You, you even mentioned technology hegemony. So what, what change in the Chinese policymakers' calculus? I, I think it's easy to say, oh, the US or the US sanctions or the US reactions made them, made the Chinese more uh, aggressive or made the Chinese realize that really this is increasingly become a no holds barred contest. Uh, but is there more to it? I mean, surely the Chinese know that this kind of uh, uh, arms arms race, this 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 ratcheting up of ret of rhetoric, isn't helping them, right? And, and actually reduces the space for maneuver, especially if you know in, in the areas they want to have greater capabilities, they are they are, they are least able to do so. Mm, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I guess it's a very good question. I. I your point is, isn't it easier to rise when people are not looking? I mean, right. it's to make it very simple. Right. And yes, it is. But on the other hand, it all depends on how you look at yourself. Yeah. I mean, if you think you're basically nearly there or already there, mm. you want to make the point that you're there because that may scare off, you know, the, the, the. so it's, so I guess, uh, I would argue that it very much depends on your standpoint. I mean, where you think you are. Mm -hmm. And frankly speaking, um, there may be a lot of hubris uh, and we may think they're not there, but they might be there because we don't really know. I mean, that's the other thing that it's becoming extremely uh, less transparent than it was then. Mm. And and therefore, I think it, again that's why I'm I'm comparing with the space race because I think there's a, a lot of um, as opposed to what was the case before, a lot of um, int I mean it vested interest in either showing what you can't do as if you could do it. I mean, supersonic weapons is the best example. China didn't need to show uh, I, I, whether this is true or not. I mean, many argue that this. It, many, I mean, Russian, Russian, you know, academics. I know that this was basically taken away from from Russia in one of these difficult uh, negotiations, including uh, part of Siberia one, because you know Russia at the time was in a very very weak situation, and they had no choice. Uh, whether this is true or not, I'll never know. But the, but what I'm saying is that China didn't need to show. Um, so in other cases, maybe China is not showing, although, you know, it, it, it's very hard to, in, in a more transparent world, just simply, you know, uh, economic yeah. competition, I would agree uh, that uh, there's the, the low, the low hanging, I mean, the lower you, <laughs> if you lower your head, it's easier. But now we are talking about um, basically, uh, I wouldn't say bluffing, but you know, like you, it's in a it's a bluffing versus secrecy yes. type game, and therefore it's very hard for us to know where we stand, mm. and that's yes. what has changed. That this has become national security. It's not about economic mm. competition. We've gone different level, and because we've gone to that different level, we don't really know. Mm. See, that that's how I would read this. Yeah. Would you also agree, just following up on your response, that this recent in the 20th Party Congress, national security featured a lot more prominently than economic yeah. development. Do you think that also increases the risk of not so rational decisions when it comes to industrial policies on semiconductors? That we're going to do this even though it doesn't make much economic sense because right, anything can be justified under the broad rubric of national security? Well, certainly, but even the U.S. has done the same thing, you know, like, like yeah, yeah, if you read, sides. you know, like, so, so it's both sides. And, uh, and I guess um, when the risk is so high, I national security, I mean, the, the price you're willing, willing to pay, to pay yeah. is much bigger. Yeah, this is about probabilities. It, it's, it's something yeah. that you really care about. So, 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 yeah, I fully agree with, with your statement. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, on that note, I, I'm afraid we're out of time, but I really just want to thank uh, Dr. Alicia Garcia Herrero for really a fascinating talk on an issue that's much discussed, but actually not well understood. Uh, I and mean, this is an incredibly complex industry with a very complex value chain. And, uh, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's quite different from the other, as, as, we, as Alicia was mentioned, it's quite different from the other industries where China has done a much better job in leapfrogging. And I think she's given, shed, helped us shed a lot of, uh, give, given us a lot of insights 
on to why this particular sector, this particular industry is so complex, why it has uh, become so sensitive uh, geopolitically, strategically, uh, and why we can expect a lot more uncertainty, unpredictability, as well as strategic rivalry uh, around this issue uh, in a way that's going to cause turbulence, right, for, for East-West, uh, West-US-China relations. So I think this is really a fascinating topic, and I'm glad that Alicia started by mentioning that this is in many ways a case study of deglobalization. And, and, and I, you know, I think at the end, I agree that this is indeed a very fascinating study of, of uh, deglobalization and the particular dynamics deglobalization might take. So on that note, uh, yeah, go ahead, Alicia, you want to talk? Sorry, Daniel, uh, Donald, because I just realized that I didn't mention something key. It's not only a showcase of deglobalization, it might end up being a showcase of bifurcation, meaning bifurcation, two ecosystems. Yeah. Because yeah. I don't think China is just going to give up. Yeah. I, I, and I, I I started with my M, M, A, SMIC uh, contact and I didn't finish that very briefly. So that is the example. Uh, his, uh, right. his response is the example of bifurcation. Basically, well, if we can't get to say, uh, below below C, uh, seven, we just use we'll, seven. we'll yeah. do in yeah. we will develop industries with what we can do that might even be very competitive because we might find yeah. different edges. So this is the key. It, yeah. The key is that we don't really know what China can do even without controlling that that specific um, uh, specific technology, and that's why I think we could envisage a world of bifurcation uh, where you yeah. have different ways to produce things, different, yeah. you know, um, so that's <laughs> all, yeah. Yeah, and bifur bifurcation or decoupling is very much in that vein of, instead of deglobalization, what we're going to see is regionalization, right? Yeah. Uh, so dif different regional blocks adopting different regional standards, which of course is very inefficient and suboptimal. Yeah. In terms of uh, in terms of con economic convergence and economic development. So on that note, uh, I really want to thank Alicia for giving for, for spending this afternoon with us, and I thank all of you for staying with us till the end. And I hope to see all of you at the next uh, IEMS seminar. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Bye.